my friends down there. Why don't we go to Chez Pierre? Here's a waitress to your table side, slender, lovely, clear blue eyed. You're a long way now from the Shagak. Enjoy it, cause you won't be back. Her lips are glossed, her velvet black pants tight. You ask her what the special is tonight. Pacific salmon, well, you're not charmed. Ask, is it wild or is it farmed? She knows the very word you want to hear and nearly whispers it in your ear. Wild, her answer tries to mesmerize you. Something tells you that she lies. wild so it's alaska where's the chef why don't we ask him was it gilled or sane or hooked is it coho or chinook through the kitchen swinging door she slips her four star apron tied around her hips among the candles and the potted ferns awkwardly you wait till she returns we're waiting When she comes back like the queen of urban modern metro hip cuisine, the chef's assurances she'll convey it's wild Atlantic sockeye from Chile. Do you bolt? Do you stay? Find Pierre and explique. Order chicken, pick a fight. Now let's eat somewhere else tonight. Well, that's one. I got a couple songs about fish most of mine tend to be about fishermen i'm afraid but we got another one that uh, celebrates the first fish of the season everybody i'm sure has a ceremony that they uh, they have for the first fish of the season and we have ours as well this is about that well i've had lots of jobs down below thought i missed them when fishing was slow when the weather turned dirty, the price only 35 cents and the bank needed dough. But each year is a new honeymoon when the stock I start running in June. All those beautiful fish I greet each with a kiss, then pitch it surprised to its doom. No job better makes me as high as when stock I hit hard in July. Those fish, fish across the roller were shortly in clover. We kissed them and then watched them die. Buy me a Shen. Nice to see you again. Buy me a Shen. Meet my deck hand. Buy me a Shen. Your loss is my gain. Yes, fish, it means you're looking grand. I could sing bell, a bell, I could sing quel beau poisson, I could sing what a beauty after all I'm anglophone. Your loss is my gain, my myth is to shame. So kiss me and say you understand. Thank you. That's awesome, John. Thanks. What a great way to start off today's discussion. John Broderick fishes for wild Pacific salmon using a set net in Bristol Bay, Alaska. So thanks again, it's an awesome way to set the tone here. Hello everyone, and thanks for joining the third episode of the Slow Fish Crew Together webinar series. I'm Carlos Stoll, and I'm president of One Fish Foundation, a sustainable seafood education nonprofit based here in Maine. Also stay tuned for the conclusion of this webinar when we'll hear live music from Melanie Brown a Slow Fish Crew Together webinar veteran and the person who patiently taught me how to pick sockeye out of a set net while fishing commercially in Bristol Bay last summer. Hopefully I didn't make too much of a fool of myself, but again, she was very patient. She's an organizer for Salmon State, a wild salmon advocacy organization where she brings a strong voice in opposition to the proposed pebble mine at the headwaters of Bristol Bay. Melanie will provide an indigenous welcome to start today's discussion. These webinars evolved from the postponement of the, co uh, the Slow Fish 2020 in March, excuse me, as a result of the pandemic. Our mission is to foster thought-provoking interactive discussion in a safe but collaborative environment. 
We want you to leave this webinar with a stronger sense of Slow Fish Network here in the US and abroad and its shared community with Slow Food and other organizations and our collective mission to connect more folks from in and around the seafood supply chain. We hope you'll draw on the courage and resilience you'll witness from our storytellers today and perhaps bring that energy and the overall sense of healing and unity into your communities. And again, as we did in the first webinar, we wanna rally around the energy we built as a community and celebrate the fun of Slow Fish as we head toward Slow Fish 2021 next March. The story of salmon is a powerful one, eliciting strong emotions from those who are directly linked to the resource for their lives. And those of us who depend on those who fish for salmon, like me, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge just a few of the salmon warriors in the slow fish community who work tirelessly to protect salmon and their habitat, rally around meaningful policy and advocate for those who harvest and distribute salmon adhering to slow fish values. Amy Grondon is a fish harvester out of Alaska and Washington state who works directly with chefs to bring wild salmon and their stories to restaurants. Gayla Hossett is Director of Natural Resources with Bristol Bay Native Association. She's one of the more prominent and consistent voices opposing the proposed pebble mine. Anne Mosness, she's a longtime commercial salmon harvester and public advocate for better seafood labeling and the perils of industrial net pen fish farming. Photographer and book author, Amy Gullick, who's recently published book, The Salmon Way, which is beautiful by the way, tells the story of wild Pacific salmon. Kaylin Cedar, who was also on the first Slow Fish Crew Together webinar, she fishes out of British Columbia and serves on the BC Young Fishermen's Network. Heather and Kirk Hardcastle are a power salmon couple, if ever there was one, who have both fished for salmon commercially, launched a high quality seafood distribution company, and who advocate for small scale fish harvesters. And then there's John Foss, AKA Johnny Fishmonger, AKA Joe Salmon of Wild Salmon Nation, who brings a fisherman's experience and passion to spotlighting net pen salmon farming hazards. In many ways, the story of salmon and how we treat them and their environment reflects the story of ourselves. Today, we're gonna to experience the salmon story from the perspectives most closely linked to the resource. If you'd like to pose a question to one of our panelists, please use the chat button at the bottom of the screen. You see that there. We'll do our best to get to as many of your questions as we can. We're exploring some deep topics and they're likely to be lots of questions. And we know that, uh, you know, you may be moved to want to weigh in and that's great. Please do so. Just remember to keep the, um, the, the safe space that we've uh, set here. You know, th this place is a part of a safety of this form is aside from the fact that we're all safely maskless like this, thankfully, means that all comments should be thoughtful and respectful and posted in a sense of healing and unity. So let's jump in and get ready to crew together. And with that, I'll turn it over to Melanie. Waka, Chamai. Uh, my English name is Melanie Brown. My Yupik name is Taikuba. Um, my great grandmother, Anna Shakan, gave it to me when I traveled from my place of birth in Sitka, Alaska to Naknik, Alaska, where my mother was born for the first time. Um, my name means somebody who has come from far away. And um, in many ways, my, my, work, my work has taken me many places. So I identify with my name in that way. But um, I also feel like, in a way, we're all traveling together in this Zoom space uh, because we're all joining from so far away. And I'm, I'm happy, so happy to be with you today. Um, I am uh, reaching out to you from Slingitani, Slingit lands. And um, these lands, were first peopled by the Takuquan and the Aquan people. And I would ask that all of you take time to acknowledge the land that you are on and who first peopled that land. Um, I'm gonna take the time to tell you just a little bit about myself. Um, later on, I'll be sharing some music as Collis said, but um, 
I would just like to take a little time to talk about my connection to salmon. Um, as I mentioned, my great grandmother, Anna Shikan, um, she gave me my Yupik name, and I was lucky enough to know her and my great grandfather, Paul Shikan, well into my 20s. And I, I fished with my great grandpa, and when he retired from fishing, he passed his set net site on to me. Um, I will be ever grateful for that. And um, both of my great grandparents, they were orphaned um, by the last great pandemic uh, that happened a century ago. It was a cruel one that took people um, who were in the prime of their lives. It was a weird shaped um, immunity curve. And my, so my parent, my great grandparents were left as young people to bring themselves into adulthood. And I think if it weren't for the salmon, um, I think it would have been much harder for them um, than, than it was. The people who were left behind, they, um, they left their traditional homes, um, their uh, semi-subterranean sod houses called barabras. They, they left their traditional homes, they burned their traditional clothing, and then they, they stepped into um, a more modern world and started living a blended existence of um, participating in, in cash economy uh, because they, they had to, uh, to survive. And um, many of us uh, in Bristol Bay are, we, we have these deep roots, um, our indigenous roots, uh, and, um, but we also participate in the commercial fishery. And um, so, um, excuse me, I kind of lost my, my thread here because I got a little emotional, but, um, so I, I truly believe that it was, it was the salmon who, who gave, gave the people who were in despair hope and taught them a path forward and were their guides, literally. Um, and I'm here because of salmon. I'm here because of the strength of my great grandparents and my ancestors and because of the salmon. And I also really believe that my my people ended up in Bristol Bay because they followed the salmon. The salmon showed them a way to this, this rich land, uh, to the, the tundra that's so rich in um, plants and how, how the, the salmon are able to travel um, in little streams and enrich the land so that the caribou and the moose have uh, food to feed on in the tundra. And I, I'm so blessed to be of this land. And um, you're going to hear about some threats to Bristol Bay today uh, from people who have connections to Bristol Bay. It instills in me great fear, but that fear is overridden by the hope that salmon give me. And um, I hope you find hope in the salmon stories that you hear today. And. And I hope you stay on long enough to, um, to hear the music that I um, plan on sharing today. Um, Kuyana, that means thank you in Yupik. Kuyana Tailuchi, that means thank you very much. Let's have a great session. Thank you so much, Melanie. Um, what a wonderful and touching way and very uh, compelling way to to start us out. So again, thank you so much. Now I'd like to introduce you to dear friend and colleague Elizabeth Herendine, who's become one of Wild Salmon's most stalwart advocates throughout Alaska and in Washington, D.C., and has been at the forefront of the decades-long campaign to stop the pebble mine in Bristol Bay. We're going to talk about that a couple times here. Based in Juneau, Alaska, where she also works for Salmon State, Elizabeth's going to moderate the conversation from here. Great. Thank you, Collis. Um, and thank you all for being here. You know, just really an honor to be with you all today. Um, I, I just want to say something quickly in response to some of what Melanie um, just said, as far as salmon, you know, really being a source of strength and hope. And I think during this time of great unrest and uncertainty, you know, I think wild salmon really 
does offer all of us the strength and hope, I think, to, to weather through these uncertain times. And here in Juneau, Alaska, where I am, you know, we're eagerly anticipating the first salmon to show up. And it's, you know, that's one of the things we can just count on year after year is the salmon will always come back if we do our part to take care of them and the things they need. But we're gonna kick things off um, today with Sally Barnes. She is joining us from West Cork, Ireland, and um, she's a former commercial fisherwoman, um, but her real passion is smoking fish, which she's been doing since 1979. And Sally's the owner of Woodcock Smokery, and her award-winning smoked salmon has won global recognition. So we're just really excited to have her with us today. And, and with that, Sally, I'll, I'll turn it to you. Hold on, Sally. We're going to unmute you here. Sally, can you unmute mute yourself? Thank you. You might, you might live to regret unmuting me. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for letting me be party to all this. I am I'm in awe of all the other speakers. Fabulous. Thank you. <clears throat> right. I'm a salmon smoker, uh, primarily. I moved to West Cork in Ireland. I was born in Scotland, brought up there, moved to England, terrible trauma, um, trained as a teacher and then moved to West Cork with the fisherman um, who became my husband. Uh, small inshore boat, um, then two children later. Um, <laughs> it wasn't possible for me to go to sea and mind the children and run, I'm, I'm talking to people who know about this, running the house, keeping the business going on the landward end of things. Um, so I started smoking fish because we didn't have a freezer when I came here first. And my former husband was a really keen angler and there were still trout in the rivers here because the water was still clean. This is 1974, 75. And in 1974-75, Ireland acceded to the European Union and the farming fraternity were allocated rather a lot of funding in order to improve the infrastructure in this country because it was pretty primitive then really. Several houses in my immediate area had no electricity. People were living a very simple life, very close to the land. And salmon was a fundamental in the diets of everybody around the coast here. You know, it's a, it's a, it's such a loss now. I'll get to that, but you know, people haven't forgotten how important it was in their diet. <clears throat> so, in the beginning, I had a tea chest with a hole in the bottom because, in order to try and give myself a shelf life, I thought I'll cure it with salt and then bit of smoke on it and change the flavor and then a couple of years after I'd started that experimenting my former husband was left a bad debt that happens in fishing you give the man the fish and you wait to be paid that didn't happen so after two years he said look I'm out of it I've smoked your fish I've got the money I've drunk it so I am really sorry you've got two small children please take the kiln so I taught myself how to use it um, and spent a lot of time trial and error. Does that work? Does that taste all right? And then in the end, in the early 90s, when my brain was shrinking and shriveling from being a grumpy mother and a fisherman's wife, I started studying uh, with the Open University because I live in quite a remote place. Um, university wasn't an option. I've no family here to mind children, to let me travel. So I did online, which was absolutely wonderful. And I studied food production systems, which taught me about bacterial activity, conservation techniques. And then the following year, I studied oceanography because I wanted to understand the fish and, you know, the whole interaction between everything inside the Earth's atmosphere, because it's all interconnected. Nothing is independent and separate. And I think we're beginning to realize that with what we're going through at the moment, that uh, it doesn't matter how much money you got in the bank or how much money you haven't got in the bank, coronavirus has brought us all into a level playing field. And I think we can see now quite clearly that we have abused the planet. We have abused all the creatures on it. and it wants to 
seek equilibrium again. That might come, please God. So the beginnings of the smokery, I started with my kiln. I taught myself how to use that. It's a, I still have it. It's a steel box and quite primitive because I like simple things. An on off switch and a thermostat, perfect. None of the computer stuff. Um, and yeah, after about five years, I thought I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. But doing the, the university stuff enabled me to understand precisely what was happening with the salting, the smoking. These are ancient means of conservation. No chemicals, you know, no dyes, no additives. I'm feeding my children. You know, if you're feeding your family, you're very concerned for them. So for me, my first customers have always been my children. Now, the dilemma. 40 years ago, before we acceded to the European Union, almost all of the farming in this country was organic. You know, farmers were impoverished, very small farms, didn't have the money for chemical applications for the land. And then when we joined the EU and gave away 95% of the fish in Irish waters to the institution in order to gain um, access to funding for the farming, agricultural end of things. Um, then the chemicals started to come in and, you know, it didn't take long for the salmon population to start diminishing because the water, the rivers had been polluted and altered. Um, because as the salmon population started to decline, I think people kind of forgot that they actually ran backwards and forwards. I mean, they are a miraculous creature. No GPS navigators, you know, they, they know where they're going. And I, I am in total awe of them. And every single fish that goes, and every single fish goes through my hands. I have a, yeah, they all get a massage. That sounds a bit silly. But we push the blood out of the flesh after the salting because, you know, we've got to get rid of the blood. So that's a major part of the conservation is to try and, stabilize the flesh and then add a smoke to it. And the smoke is antimicrobial, salt is antimicrobial. What we're trying to do is remove free water. That's enough of the technical. We'll go on to the water now. 40 years ago, an average day's drift netting at sea would have yielded maybe 200, 300 fish. Now these are the spring, not the spring fish. These are the grills. Uh, so they would be one sea winter fish. So 200, 300 fish, pretty good for an inshore boat, you know, boat under 12 meters, 36 feet. Um, and then as more and more chemicals were added to the land and slurry got into the streams, the rivers became so polluted that you know, Mark Boyden, one of my absolute heroes who runs a business called Streamscapes and educates people here and at schools about salmon. He, he said to me once, how brilliant salmon are as a bioindicator of water quality. If the water in a stream or river is not fit to carry a run of salmon, it's not fit for us to drink. We're 70 odd percent water. So if it's not fish for, fit for the fish, it couldn't possibly be fit for us to drink. And many, many people here at that stage were drawing water from rivers and streams and shallow wells. So God knows what's happened to us over that time. Um, so that was one aspect of the degradation of the rivers. The, the other one was mm, sidetracking the water and taking it to, you know, wash out factories. Um, meat plants used to be very popular places alongside rivers. So you would get blood from the processing going into the river. Um, I saw an awful bit of footage of an entire pig's gut being washed out of a sluice and into a river in the middle of this country, this is a long time ago, thank God. But you know, there was a children's playground, playground next to it and you're just thinking, this is insane. So I kept on with my son in great response. Um, never advertised, I mean, you use the fish to advertise itself. You, know, you let your product do the talking. What did I have there? Right, so towards the 2005, I suppose, the, the, the situation was getting critical. I mean, the fish were getting scarcer and scarcer, so something had to be done. Quotas were introduced then. <clears throat> 40 years ago, there were, there were no quotas. You could go out on the water in March, April. You might get a few of the spring fish then, 
but the main run would come last week in June to first two weeks in July. With global warming and climate change, that's all altered now. Um, last year, we managed to get by the middle of July, which is just about at the end of the commercial fishing, we had 150 fish and you're thinking, oh, how are we going to make that work? So in the last three weeks of the season, the, small, the smaller fish appeared in huge numbers. So we managed to acquire about 400 and that's my take for the year. And that makes me a sustainable being. The fishermen that I'm working with are really special. They've taken two weeks later before they start their fishing. They're now uh, draft and drift net fishermen in the rivers. The, the drift net fishery at sea was banned under pressure from the angling lobby through the European Union in 2007, which was, it was announced about six weeks after I just won the Supreme Champions Award at the Great Taste Awards in London for the wild Irish smoked salmon. So that was a little bit of a downer. Um, so then I was looking for stock because the rivers were polluted, they wouldn't take draft and snap net fish at that stage because of the state of the rivers. So I started buying from sea fishermen in Scotland, also, also inshore fishermen. Um, and I did that for 10 years and all the inherent issues attached to moving fish across from one country to another and la la la. Meanwhile, the degradation of the rivers was continuing and the, the habitat directive that the EU issued was to cover all aspects of habitat. And that was the uh, directive on which they banned the sea fishing for wild salmon, which made me a bit cross because I thought, well, it's not the fish is a part of that habitat. The habitat is what's wrong here. The rivers are polluted. So at the end of that story, I'm now buying snap and drop, no fish. Uh, the, the problem with climate change now is that with water heating, the recruitment of juvenile fish is not what it was. So we're, I, I don't know, I'm just going to stick in, you know, the universe will provide. But I'm looking to come out of processing wild salmon to keep myself afloat. And I'm trying to set up a school to teach. But of course, with, with what's happening now, that's on hold. So now that's me. Uh, thank you for your time and patience. Thank you, Happy Sally. to answer any questions. Yeah, um, well, and just a quick reminder that um, folks should post any questions um, or comments that they have, you know, for any of our panelists in the chat section, and we'll have time at the very end of the webinar um, where you'll get to, we'll get to hear more from each of the panelists, so please use that space. Um, but thank you, Sally, for sharing your stories. Um, and I think you're just such a great example of the need to be flexible and adaptation, you know, and I, um, the Atlantic is certainly a precautionary tale for those of us in the Pacific. Um, but I think it's just really inspiring to hear that you've been able to really maximize the few fish you do have, you know, and through food, continue to keep that pe part of people's consciousness and, and lives. Um, and I, I think your, your statement just about how the water is not fit for the fish, it's not fit for humans, just really resonates with me here in Alaska where, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll keep our water clean for fish and humans both, but thank you. Thank you again. Um, we're gonna travel to the Pacific now um, where we're gonna hear about some really exciting and important work being done to restore salmon habitat. And um, there's a habitat and cultural restoration project that's bringing back wild sockeye salmon to an indigenous community in British Columbia. So Skylar Folks is the fisheries biologist for the Okanagan Nation Alliance. And he's gonna share their efforts to restore fish habitat there and the impacts that this restoration work has had on the local people. So Skylar, take it away. Hello folks. I'll just share my screen with you and hopefully you can see this. Uh, so, why why Haskell Halt inches squeezed at Swarakan, Simgigep, Sigaramana, Gabawilta? Good day. Uh, I just introduced to you uh, first in, in Silkjin to recognize presenting to you from 
uh, the traditional silk territory here in the Okanagan in South Central British Columbia. And I also called myself Frog and finished with introducing to you in my native language of uh, Gitsanamach, being Gitsan from uh, the community of Gitanmax in the northwest coast of British Columbia. Um, the, the name Gitanmax uh, means people who harvest by torchlight. Uh, so growing up on the Skeena River, I grew up surrounded by uh, traditionally smoking fish and gill netting fish and surrounded by the smell of the smokehouses every summer. And so in terms of uh, salmon as, as a livelihood uh, has impacted me uh, from growing up to what I do today and the short story I'm about to share with you. So I'm presenting to you today from Penticton in the South Central Okanagan of British Columbia at the bottom of Okanagan Lake. And the Silk territory um, is very large and so the traditional silk uh, territory was large and varied and provided for four food types, uh, four food chiefs of the, the Okanagan being Speedlum, Sia, Skimhees, and Intis Keef. The, um, in terms of food sovereignty, the, much like many other cultures around the world, the Okanagan were salmon peoples. And so in terms of a time, a sense of time and place, the in Teeth Teeth being Chinook as one of the four food chiefs from the Okanagan, we've removed one of those four food chiefs. So I just want folks to consider for a moment how that might impact a culture when we've removed a food source or food type from a community to access. And so how's that changed? We've changed that largely with the four H's. So we're looking at Chief Joseph Dam on the Columbia River just upstream of the Okanagan, Okanagan River. Um, and so we've changed our habitat with the four H's of hatcheries, har uh, harvest, ha um, hydro habitat, har harvest and um, hatcheries. And so what's happened? So we've changed, we've drastically changed our environment by altering the course of the natural rivers. And so here is the Okanagan River downstream of Oliver, uh, upstream of the Soyuz Lake, where we've essentially reduced the available habitat by more than half. Here in Penticton, the same has happened where the channel in Penticton guts straight through the Okanagan River as it drains from Okanagan Lake into uh, Skaha Lake. And so by removing fish, we, we were down to, I would say down to the, the 4,000 returning adults in the mid 90s. And so one of the old, the late chiefs of the Okanagan, Chief Albert Saddleman, used to attend uh, policy meetings with the province and the feds and came with one very simple and powerful message and to put the fish back and to put the river back. And so in the early 1990s, the Okanagan National Alliance started and the ONA being a non-for-profit organization and our, our mandate is the conservation and protection of aquatic and indigenous resources within the fisheries department. And so starting in 1999, uh, through Bonneville Power Administration funding, we started uh, a trial return or reintroduction of sockeye into Skaha Lake. And so that last photo uh, of Skaha Lake at the bottom and Penticton where I'm speaking to you from today at the top or top left end of that photo, um, sort of reintroduction of sockeye into a system that um, had, had experienced serious declines of fish. And so what are we doing by re-putting fish back into the system is we're empowering the nation and we're returning one of the four food chiefs to the Okanagan. So the, the photo here is of our broodstock take and our collection of eggs for our hatcheries. The, everybody in this photo are in Silkshin and so there's a reconstruction, rebuilding of the reverence for salmon and rebuilding the relationship on the land. So Jim Elk scheme, meaning to cause to come back is the name of our hatchery based here in Penticton and Oddly enough, it happens to be one of the only sockeye dedicated hatcheries in the province of British Columbia. And so by putting fish into the system, I just wanna to quickly touch on that we are taking a science-based and community-based approach to how we're returning uh, sockeye and salmon into the Okanagan. And so we monitor how we're doing our, with our hatchery and our fish into the system. And so we do that by a number of different ways. Uh, here's a vessel of our acoustic transect trawl survey vessel that um, looks at determining the uh, estimates of the number of juveniles in the lake. If we think of salmon life history in three components of the lake component, the freshwater, 
uh, the freshwater river portion of juveniles heading out of the system and adults coming back and then also the third part of the ocean survival. Uh, and so we're using passive integrated uh, transponders, so pit tags, uh, by mass marking fish and monitoring their survival through the hydroelectric dams and various pit detection networks within the Columbia Basin. And so we're doing that a few different ways. Uh, we're also installing pit arrays within the systems um, to, uh, to monitor these fish moving out of the basin. But what else are we doing? So I've been talking mostly about maybe putting the fish back. But in, as part of this, the big story is putting the water back and putting the river back. And so as part of the putting the water back, um, along with ONA and the development of the Canadian Okanagan Basin Technical Working Group, the, the, the advent of the fish water management tool has been a, a water management technique that models river water flow and use within the Okanagan to limit the density independent, um, you know, scour and desiccation losses of fish improving our water management. We're also putting the river back so I mentioned we put the river back by that channelized photo, if you recall from earlier, we've returned the river to its natural flow and are letting the river do what it would have done. Uh, the gravels in this photo have naturally aggraded and have created habitat uh, in excess of what we had originally modeled when creating this. Uh, we are um, letting the river do as it does. Here in Penticton, where I'm speaking to you today, the channelization of the river is limiting what we're able to do in terms of putting the river back. And so we're aggrading gravels and creating artificial spawning beds within the channel itself. With two years ago, 20,000 adult sockeye returned to this reach uh, of the river that you're seeing. An additional component to the restoration is the movement of fish into Okanagan Lake, that large lake upstream of Penticton Dam that you just saw. And so we're re-engaging and reopening the fishway to expand and reintroduce sockeye into systems that they natively would have been in. And so a big part of the success of our of the return of Okanagan sockeye into the system is you know, empowering the nation and returning a, one of the food chiefs to the system. And so I've included this photo here because four of the five individuals in that photo are in Silkjin and Okanagan uh, nation members and are really taking care of their fish. Our hatchery it experiences greater than 90% egg to fry survival, um, which for a sockeye hatchery is fairly rare, as I understand across the Northwest coast, of, um, you know, North America and BC. And so today, I just want to quickly, as a part of this quick overview, I just wanted to finish with um, that why I'm doing what I'm doing. And so that photo is a photo of what my oldest, my oldest boy, who is now five. Uh, as part of the gillnet fishery on the Skeena River for traditionally smoking and um, cooking fair fish. So thank you for your time today. I'm um, uh, you know, grateful and would love to answer any questions later. Great. Thank you, Skylar. And yeah, again, folks, just feel free to, to post your, your questions and we'll, we'll try to get to all of them in a little bit here. Um, but yeah, thanks, Skylar, just for sharing a really beautiful and I think inspiring success story um, and showing that the salmon will come back, you know, if we make sure they have the clean water and the healthy habitat they need to thrive. And with that, with healthy salmon, we have healthy people and healthy communities and just, um, just a really great example of a community, community led effort. So thank you for sharing. Um, I'm going to hand it back over to John Broderick now. We're going to do a quick interlude, and John is going to share a, a poem or two and maybe a song as well before we travel north to Alaska. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah. Well, we have a, a party out here in Astoria, Oregon, uh, middle of every winter at the end of February, celebrating the commercial fishing industry in its community. We call it the Fisher Poets Gathering. It's been going on for a couple of decades. And uh, anybody, uh, anybody with experience living and working in the fishing community is uh, welcome to participate. You know, we just have had, uh, uh, oh, maybe four or 500 uh, men and women from the industry come and participate over the years. It's been a delight. Anyway, I thought I'd bring one of the poems that uh, has given some of us an occasion to write stuff that we wouldn't otherwise have done, which I think has generated some pretty good stuff. It's fun to hear. And many of you guys have been there. And perhaps many are listening into. Anyway, I've got a poem here I thought I'd read. My boy Henry is heading up tomorrow up to the bay and uh, 
uh, with some of my other kids and uh, he's now running one of our sites for us and is a much more competent fisherman than I am. But this is uh, a poem I wrote uh, after his first opener with us. Uh, oh, he was about eight years old, I think. It's called How to Tell a Good One. The new kid wears waders that come clear to his chin and a life jacket at his mother's wise insistence. When, at the end of a long slog across the mud, we reach the skiff, Pete, his brother, a veteran of a dozen campaigns, hauls him aboard by the scruff of his gear. But the kid coils the line as Pete pulls the anchor. Nobody has to tell him. And as we set for the first time this season, he neatly throws clear a loop of lead line from a bin board snag. He pulls when we pull, he picks when we pick, making surprisingly quick work of your basic double, number one double gill on the bag side, he hardly touches the fish. When we take a break at the water's edge, he's quick to the beach with the dip net, rounding up stragglers and climbs back into the boat three times. Practicing, he says. At the bottom of the tide, we cut the skiff loose. Pete carves a tight turn at the outside buoy. The skiff pulls up easy alongside. I snag the trip line, tie it astern. Pete toes out and up until we like what we see and we nod both. He cuts the throttle. I cast the buoy free. The boat drifts a moment in the lazy brown current and the blue two-stroke exhaust. In the bow, the new guy is watching. He hikes up his bibs, hooks his thumbs in his suspenders. What'd we just do? He wants to know. And then I brought a song, another song, because we're talking about clean water and, uh, and nothing's more important, is it, to, to the fish and the life we love. So. I, uh, we got this pebble mine you're gonna hear more from, I'm sure, uh, lately here. Kat's gonna talk about it and others. Working uh, on us in uh, Western Alaska, uh, an enormous uh, open pit sort of mine thing. Uh, you'll hear all about uh, its threat here shortly. But anyway, I thought it might be helpful to have a song for people to uh, sing uh, if ever it gets through. And of course, the problem with the mine is that we have to constantly say no to it, but you only have to say once yes. And so it's our work to always be saying no to the mine. And uh, you just worry that someday they might let it slip through, not on our watch, but sometime, you know, there's some heavy pressures to that. So I got them a song that they can sing if that ever happens. And I, it's not a, I'm not trying to be a, uh, uh, negative about it. I'm just saying this could give us an idea of what we may have to look forward to. We put it to a tune that people might be able to, might still know. It goes like this. You can sing along with the chorus if you want. The rivers once were filled with reds, ten million at a time. Belugas and the brown bears fed as salmon homeward climb. And fishermen, their families, and honest living earth went salmon from Pacific seas to Bristol Bay return. Those days before the mine, my friends, those days before the mine wish we could have them back again those days before the mine was nature free untamed and wild far as the eye could see but now foul tailings high are piled for all eternity First, tis only trace, they said, the fish will be just fine. But leaching coppers left them dead that came from Bevel Mine. 
Those days before the mine, my friends, those days before the mine, would we could have them back again those days. Water's clear and cold there yet, cold and clear and bare. Now nothing lives in the sugar those salmon once ran there. Those days before the mine, my friends, those days before the mine, would we could have them back again those, those days. days Hope they ever need it. Thank you. Thank you, John. And yeah, look forward to seeing you and others, hopefully in Astoria in February at Fisher Poets. So yeah. Yeah, I hope Great. so. <laughs> All right. So we are going to go to Alaska, where we're going to hear a couple um, more stories from folks on the ground there, starting um, with Catherine Carscallon, who is in Dillingham, Alaska, in Bristol Bay. And Kat's a driftnet fisherman and literally grew up fishing for salmon. And she's really dedicated her entire adult life fighting to protect her community and her way of life from the proposed pebble mine that John and others have referred to so far. So Catherine uh, currently serves as the executive director of the Commercial Fishermen for Bristol Bay Coalition, which some of you might be part of, um, and also works closely with United Tribes of Bristol Bay and others and the National Coalition um, fighting to protect this irreplaceable source of wild salmon. So Catherine, it's all yours. Thanks, Elizabeth. And, and thanks for that song, John. That's the first time I've heard the whole thing and it honestly gave me chills. Um, and it reminds me of the John Prine song, Paradise, which was, I, we had a great music teacher when I was little and we sang that all the time. And now looking back, I wonder like if she, <laughs> if she knew stuff was going on and, and kind of implanted those kinds of feelings in, in our heads, but I truly hope that song never has to be sung. Um, so thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I am from Dillingham, Alaska, which I'll, I'll describe the area a little bit. If you haven't seen Bristol Bay on a map, we're basically right at the mouth of the Nishigak River. And Elizabeth's right, I, I truly wouldn't exist without the salmon here. My parents um, met up here in Ecock, Alaska, which is a little village just south of here, a fishing village. and. They met, my mom was running her own boat. Um, she had kind of migrated up here from Washington after the fisheries there felt some declines. And my dad came up with my grandpa and his siblings fishing. So they, they met there in Ecock and eventually um, built their own boat together and, and raised my brother and I up fishing. So, I think when we, when we talk about Bristol Bay, we, you often hear, you know, we produce, half the world's sake production and you know just millions and millions of pounds harvested averaging 10 to 50 million pounds a year or 10 to 50 million fish a year harvested in the last 10 years on average each year and it, it just it truly sounds like a huge fishery which it is in production but as far as um are the fishermen themselves it's it's really just a huge small boat fishery so you, you're seeing pictures of that's my boat there the seahawk we are limited to 32 foot boats and most of us run crews of anywhere from two to five people. So, so it really is just a high number of small boat fisheries participating in Bristol Bay. And, and really it, it totals to about 14,000 workers each year that come up um, that are either based here locally like myself or in Alaska or, or really truly come from all over the country and the world. I think we have, we have deckhands based out of every state in the in the country. So like I said, I, I did grow up fishing and, and I think growing up in it, probably like any trade, it, it feels like a chore or forced labor. Like I, I don't think I, I really truly started to appreciate it until I guess, you know, it, it started putting me through college and I started pursuing other careers, but it, but Bristol Bay always brought me back. I came back every summer to fish and, and it, it, helped me get through college and and kind of showed me that you know I was I was learning more than just a trade or or just kind of the family business it really is a way of life that I I wanted to adopt so I bought my boat 10 years ago um yeah this will be my 10th season fishing my boat and it it really has 
I mean, I just feel very, very thankful and blessed to have the opportunity to harvest these salmon every year. Um, and as fishing was putting me through college, the threat of the pebble mine came on the scene. Northern Dynasties is a company out of Canada and they acquired the property, I think the year before I went to college and we really started hearing about them holding meetings out in the region, out, out here and, and proposing their mine. And over the last 16 years, Elizabeth right? it really has kind of shaped my adult life. Um, in defending something that I, I think I, I really took for granted growing up. Um, and and when, when basically everything we know here in Bristol Bay and everything we, we see as normal is, is threatened by the proposal of, of this massive project, it really put a lot of things in perspective for me and I, I think also probably contributed to my, my desire to really just make this my life. Um, so I settled back here in Dillingham after college and, and really started participating in the fight against this mine. So I, I know a lot of the listeners probably have, have heard of Bristol Bay and have a little bit of idea, so I won't go too depth in detail, but I, I think it, I really appreciated the presentation um, out of Canada because I think Bristol Bay really represents what, what the Pacific Northwest ha always looked like. And, and we're just so lucky that the people who have lived here for millennia have really kept it that way. So Bristol Bay, when we, we talk about this region, it's a watershed about the size of West Virginia. Um, and in spite of the fact of housing this huge fishery with this high production, that, that's why I wanted to highlight how small our boats are because really the infrastructure that exists here is, is so minimal. The longest, the longest road in our area runs from my town to the neighboring village and it's 22 miles. And that's, that's really, you know, there's 32 villages dotting the landscape here and and like I said the the majority of the land when you fly over it's it's exactly as it was a thousand or ten thousand years ago and and that truly is why we have the salmon runs that we have so the commercial fishery has been industrialized or, or commercialized for about a hundred and a little over 130 years and thanks to close management really modeled after you know, the way the original people, the Yupik, Athabascan, and Dinana people who have lived here for millennia manage the fish by allowing enough to go upstream to spawn every year. So we're, we're, we're managed on that same, on that same method where we, we are given openings to fish and we fish when, um, when enough fish have gone up river. So there are, our, our management system really literally consists of people standing in towers counting fish as they swim by and 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 the Alaska Department of Fish and Game has this close management system that allows enough fish to go by and spawn and we're just taking little bites out of it. So the the infrastructure that exists now compared to what the proposed pebble mine would bring um, it just doesn't it doesn't compare this is this mine would really be the foot in the door for what potentially could be a mining district right upstream from from where all of these salmon live and and smack dab in the middle of of really essential salmon habitat so just for a quick review if if um this is new to anyone the pebble deposit it's located upstream of two of the major river systems that feed bristol bay so it's a 10 billion ton deposit of ore that like I said, has yet to be mined, but what, what the proposal would be, would be to mine, mine the ore and leave the waste rock behind. It's very low grade ore, so, so it would require essentially digging up all the ore, grinding it to a pulp, extracting about one half of 1% of the usable, um, usable mineral and, and leaving the rest behind in tailing stems that would need to be cared for in perpetuity. And, and the land around here, much of it is, is sulfide based and this ore is a sulfide ore deposit. So in that production, you know, the rock itself becomes toxic when it's exposed to air and water, it, it produces acid. And, and so those, those tailing stems, there is no mitigation of that. Those would be toxic until the end of time and, and need to be cared for. So that's that's the main main concern is is some sort of catastrophic failure of those tailings down. But then all the incremental problems that salmon have faced all over the Pacific Northwest would come along with the production of this mine. So it, they're proposing to build a 120 mile transport road in an area with essentially no roads. Um, 
gas and fuel pipelines and a slurry pipeline to get to get the ore out and you know it's not it's not talked about by the company a lot but there are mining claims in this whole area so so really there are a lot of companies just waiting in the wings for this infrastructure to go in um, and it would make all these other areas a lot more mineable so so when we look at this and our concern is really based at a permanent and irreversible and hugely damaging change to our entire region which right now it it's a, it's salmon country it's that's that's what is bristol bay is about and and this is proposing to change that entirely so just a quick review of what the status of the pebble mine is for those of you who have been following it closely we are we're essentially at the point that we've always feared so i've like elizabeth mentioned i've been involved in the fight against this for about 10 12 years and and the thing we've always feared was really that they would enter the permitting process um because our our process isn't set up to assess a project like this there's never been a mine of this type proposed in a sensitive habitat area like this and as bad as we feared it might be when they entered the permitting process i would i would say it's tenfold worse so the pebble partnership applied for it's the main federal permit they would need to to build this mine in december of 2017 and and they've just been breezing through the process, it's, it's really been fast-tracked and the Army Corps of Engineers oversees that permit. Um, and they produce an environment, if you follow the NEPA process, they produce an environmental impact statement. And the draft of that statement came out last February and we were given the opportunity to comment on it. The public, federal agencies, um, member of Cong members of Congress all take, took a look at this draft and there was just overwhelming an overwhelming reaction that that it's it was just woefully incomplete. It really is. Um, it doesn't even come close to representing what what mining of the full deposit would look like. It, it's it's kind of a, just a foot in the door proposal, and where you would hope Army Corps of Engineers would hold the hold the permit or hold hold Pebble Mine to a higher standard they're really just taking everything they're being told at face value and the cooperating agencies that are are representing us have given very you know very harsh feedback on the proposed environmental impact statement but it wasn't taken so now fast forward to today we're right on the verge of seeing a final impact statement come out and from the cooperating agencies that have have reviewed it including some local tribes it's clear they didn't improve their draft at all um, they really are just taking Pebble's word for it on a lot of things like the for some some of the main I won't go into all the details, but some of the main issues with it. It's it's completely missing any sort of analysis of a tailing stamp failure. So they're just they're just breezing by that by by taking the mines assurances that a, a tailing stamp will not fail and and you know the proposed dam type has has never their proposed tailings pond has never been built or used before and especially not in a wet climate like we have um so like i mentioned a, a lot of the cooperating agencies who looked at the first draft and and members of congress and, and alaska senior senator all warned and gave feedback that this this impact statement needs to be improved that the army corps needs to improve their process and and to date rather than responding they've only they've only stuck to their timeline so we're we're expecting a final environmental impact statement and a final permit decision in june or july which is right when when all of us are out fishing busy with subsistence harvest or commercial fishing um so we're we're really at the mercy of federal agencies doing their job so the only the only there is no more public opportunity for comment or anything else so the only opportunity we have is that the clean water act allows the environmental protection agency to place restrictions on or, or actually veto this permit. And, and that's really our best hope at this point is that they would veto the permit and that our members of Congress would hold the EPA to that standard. So, so far we've already asked the EPA to take this action under the Clean Water Act um, years ago. And, and rather than taking the action, they studied the project and they did conclude that building this mine would have adverse and unacceptable impacts to our fishery, to our salmon, to our waters. Um, so my sincere hope is that they will take that one step further and act, but I'm also 
realistic in my fear. I think that that they won't act. And so we really are calling on, on our members of Congress, on Alaska senators, you know, senators around the country to have an oversight role in this and, and really hold EPA accountable um, and hold Army Corps accountable and, and not just let Pebble just sweep this through the process at a time when really everyone, the final, the final months of this permitting process, everyone in the country and, and especially here in Bristol Bay have been, have been readying and preparing for a fishery that brings an influx of upwards of 10, 12, 14,000 people into a very remote area and, and with the situation we're facing with COVID, that's taken up everyone's time and energy, um, including the Army Corps in a lot of areas. So our hope was with the, that they would delay the process that already needed delaying um, and, and give everyone here a little more time to participate and, and give feedback. And, and rather than doing that, they really did just bulldoze their way through the process. So that feeds my fear that in in the end they won't do the right thing and that EPA might not veto the permit so it like I said it, it really were in the position of being completely dependent on on our elected representatives um, so I think as as I get my boat ready and you know in a couple of weeks here um, John's family and myself and, and everyone in Bristol Bay really is going to go off the grid for a couple months and and start harvesting salmon and and that's that's the bright light in all of this i think with the threats that we're facing right now that the you know the salmon don't don't care about any of this there's as long as their habitat is left intact which right now it is um they're about to come back in full force and and we're going to do our jobs and and harvest them and provide them to the world but um in the meantime i just really hope that our elected officials do their jobs and, and look out for it and anything anything anyone else can can do to help with that i think we'll we'll share a, a little link to to what you can do to help but at this point the really the only reason we don't have a mine and we a mine hasn't been built in this past 16 years that it's been threatened is is because not just bristol bay residents and alaskans but really people all over the nation have have come together to help us on this issue and and speak up about it and, and not forget you know not let it go not just be an issue that you hear about one year and forget about i've i've run into even even Collis. I, I met him i think six six years ago in in reference to this issue and you, i keep running into the same people and everyone's still just as fired up as they were years ago which i just i'll never stop appreciating that because it's you know it's life to all of us who live out here but it's it really really makes my heart swell that so many people you know who have never even been to bristol bay care so much about this issue so i just like to pass on my thanks for that and thank thank you for you know highlighting this today great thank you kat um well and i just want to extend my my gratitude to you Catherine, having worked alongside you for the last 10 plus years you know i can say that it's really been your passion and dedication that have allowed us to successfully, you know, stall the pebble mine for as long as we have. So thank you for everything you're, you're doing there every day. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, the pebble mine, it is an issue that has gained national attention and is one that, you know, we all really need, need to be paying close attention to, especially over the coming weeks as the final EIS comes out, as the final record of decision comes out. I mean, this is an issue that affects a lot of us directly and indirectly. And I think too, though, is just a really critical moment um, for anyone who cares about wild fish and wild salmon. Like this is our land, last chance to do it right the first time, you know, and to learn from Ireland, to learn to what's happened in the Northwest and British Columbia. And so, yeah, and so I just think, you know, we all need to, you know, share responsibility and, and take the time to be engaged. Um, you know, and, and with that, I, I want to transition over to Mark Titus, a dear friend and colleague who has been helping us raise this national awareness for years now and sharing, you know, the story of salmon with audiences all over the country and the world. And this has been a really key piece of our efforts um, and he's done that through his 2014 film called The Breach which some of you might have seen um, and his newest film called The Wild. So Mark's going to give us a quick update on The Wild um, and how you can be part of his virtual tour which is actually kicking off later today. So, so Mark. 
thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and uh, thank you folks for putting this on. It's an honor to be here with all of you. You are the salmon warriors that I aspire to be. And um, I uh, say this to you every time I get to see you. I, I, I see you more than I see my own family. And um, it's now I'm kind of shedding that uh, mantra and just kind of accepting that you are my extended family. And uh, um, I feel very much in a uh, connected heart space with all of you. Um, so I, I really can't add anything uh, about the Bristol Bay issue that Kat didn't cover. It was uh, pretty stark and, um, and very accurate. And what I will tell you about is uh, my connection briefly um, to Salmon and then uh, what we're doing with this film tour. Um, so I'm, I live in Seattle, Washington, and I grew up here, started fishing with my dad when I was two years old, uh, caught first king salmon then, and, uh, uh, and fell in love with these animals, um, such that uh, I headed up to Bristol Bay when I was 18, and I worked in the commercial uh, industry, commercial fishing industry, for three years in a packing plant um, as a freezer foreman uh, just down the street from where Catherine lives and um, and fell in love with Alaska and the wilderness and further in love with salmon, which uh, only was completely compounded and finalized for me by spending all of my 20s in Southeast Alaska as a uh, salmon fishing guide in the wilderness uh, in the Tongass National Forest. Um, so were it not for uh, falling in love with my wife and, uh, and ending my guiding career abruptly and moving back to Seattle, I would likely still be there um, biding my time with the seasons and, and being in love with these animals. But I couldn't make films from there, so here we are. Um, so Indeed uh, came out with a film called The Breach in 2014, which was kind of my big picture love story for wild salmon and a lament to what's happened to them here in the Pacific Northwest waters I call home, uh, where they are no longer what they currently are in Bristol Bay. Um, and so uh, we ended that film on a vignette about Bristol Bay and a, a bit of a hopeful uh, note on that. During that time, the current EPA under the Obama administration had put in place preemptive protections for the Bay um, through the 404C. Things changed abruptly in 2016, um, both on the political landscape for our country, as we well know, and, uh, and for me personally. And so um, what really was a, a part of that political change um, turned into an internal change in me as well, in that uh, I, uh, I had to deal with my own issues with addiction and um, uh, went clear down to the very bottom of where I could go. And, then still um, was really called back from um, this place that I was in by this love for these wild salmon, which are the ultimate symbol to me of sacrifice and of giving of themselves so that life itself can continue. So um, 50 days after coming out of rehab, I was on a boat in uh, Bristol Bay filming the wild. And um, this film uh, is ab about that journey and using the metaphor of my own uh, recovery from addiction to paint the picture about where we are as a people and as a species and how we treat this planet. So uh, the virtual tour um, Elizabeth described is, is beginning tonight. Uh, we were going to go physically across this country to 50 cities uh, with a food trailer, be bringing Bristol Bay sockeye to everybody on the way and that abruptly changed with COVID-19. So. Like all the rest of you, we are pivoting and adapting and uh, we are moving from region to region, uh, starting tonight with the great Northwest, uh, which will encompass Alaska, Western Washington, and then a separate screening actually at 7 p.m. Eastern time uh, in Washington, D.C. So um, I encourage you to, to join this movement, uh, to get involved, to tell your friends if you're able to join us tonight, um, I'm going to put a link up in the chat for you to uh, be able to access that. And, um, and also, um, we will be providing, we're launching a website tonight uh, called Ava's Wild, which is the word save spelled backwards. And um, that will house all of the action items that we currently have identified uh, to get involved for Bristol Bay. That'll include all the amazing work that Salmon State is doing and that Commercial for Fishermen for Bristol Bay and United Tribes for Bristol Bay. All of the work that um, you know my incredible partners are doing here will be 
uh, housed in that space. So uh, I'll go ahead and put that up in the chat. And um, I think that went to the panelists and attendees. Hold on, I'll do it both ways. And with that, um, I'm around here to ask and answer any questions for any of you. And um, again, I'm just incredibly grateful to be here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. Um, and having seen the wild myself a couple times now, um, I definitely encourage everyone here to check out the links that are posted in the chat section. You know, it's just a really important and compelling story and, and couldn't be more timely. So thank you, Mark, because I know it's been a real labor of love in many ways. Um, so we're now going to finish with our live panelists and get a report from Marsh Skeel, who's the co-founder and vice president of Sitka Salmon Shares. And he's going to talk about, you know, their story as a business, how they've evolved, you know, and some of the lessons they've learned along the way and bringing wild salmon directly to consumers around the U.S. Um, so with that, we'll hear from Marsh. Uh, thanks for the intro, Elizabeth. Uh, hey everyone, Marsh Skeel here. I'm a second generation uh, salmon fisherman. So I, I grew up, uh, I was born in Sitka and grew up in, uh, in Port Alexander. So a little bush community on the same island as Sitka and Tongass National Forest. Um, and like many of the other fishermen, um, you know, fell in love with the, it, it seemed like, like just like hard work and, and, and labor uh, growing up doing it. But uh, doing other things. I was, I was still fishing a little bit and always drawn back to it. So I went to school and came back to Alaska and was still fishing in the summertime. And in, in uh, 2010, I, uh, I decided to buy my own uh, commercial salmon trawler, hook and line salmon boat, the loon, which I still have. Um, and during that time, I was, uh, I've always been really loved to share food and Sitka's got this great community of kind of, of dinner, dinner parties. And so uh, in one of these dinner parties, I met my business partner, Nick, and he was working on his PhD on kind of sustainable food systems. So we became good friends over sharing, sharing good, good food and fish and salmon. And, uh, and I, I, I had some of my fish processed up and they, those went, he got a job in the Midwest teaching university. And so I sent some fish down for a, for a, a environmental nonprofit benefit. And everyone loved the fish and wanted more of it. So Nick and some of his students kind of got sick of salmon shares started. And then in, uh, and then in 2012, I sent fish down again, more of my catch. And, uh, and they did a little kind of share of, of this my summer catch to people in the Midwest. And uh, I was able to, at the end of the season, to go down there and meet the people that, that got the fish. And they were super excited. And to me, that was like the, this big kind of, it, the light came on of like, as a fisherman, you're out there catching this beautiful fish and gutting it and icing and doing all this work. And then it just kind of, you sell it to a processor and you don't, you don't know where it goes. You, you know, you, you don't really get that good of a price a lot of times. And so I love the fishing part of it, but that connection to like the whole chain to provide people that were super excited about the, the fish and to get a better, more fair price all seemed like something that was, that really spoke to me. So, so I, I bought in to be an owner of the company with bought some shares of the company and kind of just helped organize the Alaska side and had been helped building it ever since. Um, in 2015, we added, um, are the, the small company that was processing our fish was going out of business. So we didn't really have an option of what we're going to do to have our fishermen's catch processed for, for our community supported fishery. So we bought a processor and in the process of doing that, we added fishermen owners. So um, we started with, I think, eight fishermen owners, eight or 10 fishermen owners. And now we, we have 23. Um, and the point of that is to have them be shared to share the benefits when the company does well and also to build that relationship even stronger. So, you know, what we're trying to do in this supply chain from Alaska fish to the started in the Midwest, now it's nationwide, but is to try to care for the fish as much as we can so that the that people are willing to pay the value that can support the support fishermen doing it the right way and not catching more fish and just really treating their fish really well and kind of keep them economically viable so as as the prices for all these 
boats and fuel and gear goes up, the salmon price has been pretty low. So this is really like a, through the community supported fishery, um, we can build in kind of a more stable domestic market to keep our guys going. Um, so we added fishermen owners and bought our own processor and that's been like a, uh, that's what I'm here doing now is helping uh, run our processor and manage our fishing fleet, which is a, you know, it's a big, uh, it's a big step for any small company to figure out how to run fish processors and you got blast freezers and all kinds of paperwork you don't even want to know about. Um, but, uh, you know, this was all kind of in our quest to provide that perfect fish. So right from the fisherman owner, having our own processor means we can really freeze it perfectly at 50 below and then home deliver it to someone. So like really know that they're getting this amazing piece of fish. And through that, we want to tell that whole entire story. So, you know, we have a, a closed Facebook group where fishermen are posting what they're catching and people are posting the recipes. So we really spend a lot of energy on kind of telling the story of all these small scale fishermen and what they're doing um and our pe people getting the fish really love it to have that really strong connection and uh and we also uh we also do one percent of the wild so like of course we rely on all these natural systems to sustain our our salmon we need clean healthy water so um you know that's something we built in um, to try to give towards give towards the wild that kind of keeps sustains our business and our and our fishing fleet, and that's really uh, important to us. Um, yeah, well, I don't know if I left anything out there, but um, I think that's it. And I'll be around for questions if anyone has any later. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Thank you, Marsh, especially because you were just fishing a few hours ago. <laughs> so thanks for, uh, yeah, joining us here. And um, yeah, Marsh will be around for questions because I know for a lot of direct marketers and others that are trying to create new distribution systems to customers, Sitka Salmon Shares is a great success story um, when it comes to those logistics. But I think as Marsh said, it's not just about the moving fish, but it's also telling the story of the fish as a way to really maintain that connection and building the community that's really at the heart of all this. So they've done a really exceptional job at that. Um, so we are going to finish before we go to question and answer and discussion with all of you. We're going to finish today's presentations with a short message, video message from California Congressman Jared Huffman, who is co-chair of the Wild Salmon Caucus and is also chair of the House Subcommittee on Water, Oceans, and Wildlife. Um, Representative Huffman is a longtime ally of the slow fish, slow food community, and has really been a leader on some of the issues you've heard about here today, um, especially the proposed pebble mine in Bristol Bay. And he's just been working diligently to safeguard the habitat and the wild places that wild salmon need to thrive, um, and just ensure that wild salmon remain part of our country's future when it comes to their cuisine, our culture, our ecosystems, and our economy. So with that, we're going to hear a few words from Representative Huffman. Hi, everyone. I'm Congressman Jared Huffman. Thanks for inviting me to join today's Slow Fish webinar on salmon. I'm glad that this community has been able to come together today, at least virtually, on a topic that is important to so many of us from the California coast up to the Pacific Northwest and Alaska. In my Northern California district, salmon are not only in our rivers, they're part of our history, our culture, our way of life. We're salmon people. The North Coast is home to many tribes that have relied on salmon since time immemorial for subsistence, culture, and ceremony, and their livelihoods. Commercial and recreational fishers depend on healthy salmon populations, and their fishing activities connect all of us to this shared resource, whether we're enjoying a day on the water or just eating a delicious grilled salmon filet. I'm getting hungry just thinking about it. I'm also missing the great experience of being out fishing on one of our great salmon rivers or on the ocean, enjoying that experience with friends and family. That's one of the things I'm most looking forward to once we're able to safely get in groups together again. Because salmon are such an amazing, resilient, culturally significant, and delicious fish, they're a perfect example of the slow food and slow fish movement that you all are a part of. Salmon teach us a lot about our environment, 
from upland riparian habitats to fragile estuaries to marine ecosystems. But many salmon populations are at risk, as you already know. Unfortunately for us in California, a lot of those at-risk populations are here in our state. From climate change to habitat loss, salmon are facing a lot of challenges. But if you give salmon good conditions, clean water with fish passage and healthy habitat, they thrive. That's why last October, I introduced the Salmon Focused Investments in Sustainable Habitats Act. That's a mouthful. The acronym is the Salmon Fish Act. The bill would identify and protect important salmon habitat across our country by identifying areas of strong salmon abundance, diversity, and productivity. This bill aims to protect areas where salmon populations are still thriving to make sure that we keep these places intact well into the future. Through a five-year grant program and increased funding for existing watershed protection programs that benefit salmon, our bill takes a proactive approach to investing in the country's most pristine salmon habitat and then preventing the type of habitat loss and degradation that we've seen impact salmon populations in so many other places in the past. The bill is currently going through the legislative process and had a positive hearing earlier this year in the Water, Oceans, and Wildlife Subcommittee that I chair. We have support from conservation, recreation, and fishing organizations, and I've worked with tribes, stakeholders, and scientists to fine-tune this bill. While I will do my best to keep the bill moving this Congress, this will most likely require a long-term effort, and I'm committed to pursuing this as well as other salmon-focused initiatives. That brings me to another issue that's particularly important to me, the Pebble Mine. Now, many of you are already aware of my opposition to the proposed Pebble Mine, which would have irreversible, long-lasting impacts on the Bristol Bay watershed and one of the world's most productive salmon runs. The Army Corps of Engineers is continuing to rush through its flawed review process, but the fight is not over. Last year, my amendment to an appropriations bill to stop this flawed process passed the House of Representatives. And while it didn't make it into the final bill, I'll keep working to make sure that we shine a light on and stop this problematic project. Unfortunately, the Pebble Mine is just one of many examples where we've seen federal agencies push ahead with special interest to the detriment of salmon and the people who depend on them. So, I am uh, working on other ways to ensure that we can protect salmon when it comes to decisions that impact salmon habitat, such as water diversions, energy development, or other resource extraction. We need to ensure that essential fish habitat under the Magnuson-Stevens Act is fully considered when it comes to federal actions. Fishery managers should have a seat at the table when it comes to federal decisions that impact salmon habitat instead of going through a letter writing exercise that stakeholders have told me amounts to little more than a paper tiger. Now, there's a lot to do when it comes to fighting for salmon, and I'd like to end on a positive note. While the ongoing public health crisis has challenged our communities and economies, we should take the opportunity to build back more sustainably and more equitably. And that's why I've led efforts to advocate for resilience and restoration funding, including for coastal and watershed restoration in recovery stimulus legislation. We all know the importance of healthy ecosystems and restoration and resilience projects. They provide jobs, support communities, and provide numerous other benefits. This is the time for us to ensure future generations can find their own connections to salmon like we've all been able to do. So I hope to continue working with all of you in the fight to protect our salmon and support our coastal communities. Thanks for having me and for holding this important discussion. Well, it's definitely reassuring to know that someone like Congressman Hoffman is working at a legislative level to protect crucial salmon habitat. So I think we're lucky that we were able to get him to, to uh, record this message because it's sort of uplifting to us all and very thankful for the work that he and his staff are doing. So now we're going to start with the q and A. I I know we've got a little bit, just a little bit of time here. and We might check to see if you all are interested. We might go a little past it because we've got some good questions here that we want to address. Um, talking about pebble mine, talking about supporting the wild fish. So 
Um, we may push it a little bit beyond that, if that's okay with you all. Um, so if, if you want to chime in, again, you know, use the chat section. Um, uh, we'll do the best we can to get as many of your questions as we can. I don't have that much time, but we'll get to the most salient ones. Um, again, please remember that we're working to strengthen the community around Wild Sim. So I'll turn it over to Elizabeth because she's got a good one to start with. Yeah, thanks, Collis. Um, yeah, so someone asked about the state of Alaska's position on the Pebble Mine and whether or not the state of Alaska has the ability to override the Army Corps or federal federal permitting decisions. So, Catherine, I'm wondering if you could could speak to that, please. Yeah, thanks. So. Um, as far as I know, no elected official in the state of Alaska has taken a position in favor of the pebble mine, but what is a common line, um, especially out of our governor, is that we need to allow the process to go forward, uh, which to us is, is synonymous with allowing the mine to go forward because there aren't triggers in the process, especially the state process that protect us. So there are about 60 permits that pebble would need, and this federal permit is is the main dredge and fill permit. It's the major, it's the only big federal permit they would need, um, but there's also a state process. But, but like I said, no, there aren't these triggers in that process like the EPA has where they can assess the, the overall risk. So um, as far as where, where the state, how the state of Alaska feels as far as its citizens, it's, it's been in opposition of the mine that the majority of Alaska citizens have opposed the mine for, for over 10 years now based on polls and those numbers haven't changed. Um, and a lot of our elected officials oppose it but the the sneaky way you get around it is just not taking a position or saying you support the process um or just implying that we can have both that that if if there's a mine they would never support a mine that it would affect the fishery but on paper no mine that's permitted will have damage you know every 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 mining proposal is well intentioned and and really what what we need is to look at the risk um hopefully that answers the question yeah, thank you, Pat. Um, you know, I'll just say at the public level in Alaska, you know, the residents of Bristol Bay remain, you know, staunchly opposed to the pebble mine, and the majority of Alaskans statewide are opposed to it as well. But yeah, it's our, our state administration that is certainly worrisome. And some of you may have seen the news articles that came out last summer. Was it last summer? It's a blur. Um, but where our governor was basically taking letters that the Pebble Partnership provided him and sent them to President Trump and the White House in support of Pebble. So unfortunately, while Governor Dunleavy here in Alaska hasn't come out um, publicly saying he's pro-Pebble, he is very much um, helping them out in many ways behind the scenes, which is worrisome. But yeah. And there's a there's a picture that's been circulating around the web since last summer when his picture was taken with the president aboard Air Force One. So if there's any question about where his allegiances lie, um, you know, that says a lot. And there have been also a couple of questions in the chat about what can we do as people who are not directly um, involved with it, which a lot of us are here. And, and that, that really is just paying attention to what's going on and contacting your Congress, your, your, your representatives, even if you don't live anywhere near Alaska. I live in Maine, but I'm contacting my senators uh, and representatives and say, look, this is a bad mine. It's a bad mine, wrong mine, wrong place. That's sort of the, the mantra. So we're gonna have some resources. We're gonna kick them up uh, in a little bit uh, on the screen. Um, there was another question here that we wanted to address that came up about how can people who are not directly living in the Pacific Northwest support the fish and the people who are fishing for them? And really, it, it almost seems counterintuitive, but eat the fish that have been harvested responsibly. That's it. You know, you are, you are sort of promoting the fish by making sure that the properly managed fisheries, which by the way, in Alaska and along the Pacific West, uh, Northwest, but particularly in Alaska, it's one of the best fit managed fisheries in the world. And I've seen that firsthand. I mean, I've, I've, I was with Melanie in her uh, boat and we were picking sockeye out of a set net. And then a few days later, I was fly fishing up above the, where the whole fishery was and just seeing the stream of chrome swimming past, happily going to do 
their biological fate and reproduce and uh, propagate the species. So it's an amazing fishery. It's well done. If you eat the salmon and, and get acquainted with um, the issues that are around it, that's doing a lot to support the fish and the fish harvesters. And I'll just, if I can, just add for folks who are wanting to find, you know, who where those sources of, you know, salmon or sustainable seafood are that are coming from community-based fisheries like Sika Salmon Shares. You know, there's great online mapping um, and search resources like the Local Catch Network. There's a seafood finder for values-based, small-scale, community-supported fisheries. Um, and that covers North America, so both U.S. and Canada. If you're looking for potential suppliers and want more information about those. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so, uh, and actually Jennifer, if you could, she'll put that up in the chat section, the link to Local Catch Network there. Um, so then there was an, another question that came up around sort of the thinking around um, hatcheries and what that balance is between you know, the hatchery and the support of the, the wild population, as was happening with the Okanagan Nation Alliance that Skylar shared with us. So um, Skylar, could you maybe flesh that out just a little bit to talk about how that is as a supplemental operation? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, certainly, you know, in that very high level conversation about the restoration work that's happening in the Okanagan, um, you know, the hatchery is just one small part and is a tool in the restoration. You know, the freshwater management, uh, improved water management component is a huge part. The habitat restoration piece, if you're improving their survival in lake and if you're improving, you know, any limiting factors on that freshwater, both the river and the in lake component of the life history of those salmon, uh, you're doing well. So the, 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 the hatchery component um, you know, I brought it up as just one, again, one part of the tool, but it's certainly uh, a hatchery supplementation technique with the long-term goals of eventually having a self-sustainable population, um, you know, that naturalizes and, you know, the hatchery is weaned off of supplementing the stock and can move to other, um, you know, more at-risk populations of fish in our area. Um, you know, so it started as sockeye. We do have Chinook um, in our hatchery as well, and so we're working on uh, you know, sh Chinook restoration in the area. Um, but again, it's, you know, we follow Alaskan protocols for, you know, the sockeye within our hatchery and take less than, you know, 10% of, um, you know, the, the fish put back onto the spawning grounds in any given year. And so there's a significant wild and hatchery wild portion of the fish that are returning. And, you know, with the importance of maintaining a genetic diversity in the stock and, you know, again, as a tool to help naturalize that population. Thanks, Skylar. And, that, and, that, and that's the point. It's, it's just trying to get the wild population, you know, a boost so that they can take it up on its own. And it, as long as you, you've got that managed well, that's what works. And I did want to circle back on something real quick because here I am, you know, I've, I've got this sustainable seafood education nonprofit. I go into classrooms and the first question I get test, uh, students to ask, whether they're six or they're 15 or 17, is where is it coming from? And so to, with uh, regard to the question about how to support the salmon, from the perspective of markets here, the fishermen here, and the fish here, it's really important to know where that salmon's coming from. Because as our friend Jim McIsaac um, had mentioned here, he's from t Suzuki organization, and he's also been one of the collaborators for these webinars. He said that there's been a flood of Russian sockeye that's coming into the BC and it's competing with domestic fishermen and their prices. So that does matter. It does matter. Asking that question is very important. So I just wanted to sort of bring that out here. Um, I think um, we're, we're, we're probably pretty good. I mean, we can, we're gonna address some, you know, we'll be available to answer some more questions, but at this point, I think it's probably a good idea to start the wrap up. We'll have, um, a recording of this video available and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining this conversation. As I said up front, salmon is a special species and it really brings out um, a lot of unity for all of us. So, you know, we're going to view this again as another platform for further discussion 
more community building, and more action. We'll soon post a recording of this webinar on the Slow Fish website. Um, it'll be on a YouTube channel that we have. We encourage you to continue the conversation. If you'd like to reach out to any panelists, send an email to Jennifer Halstead or directly to any of the panelists that may want to add their uh, email address in the chat section. Um, or if you'd like to broach questions for the broader community, feel free to post them at the Slow Fish, Fish Locally Collaborative, or Local Catch Listservs. We're gonna take a pause over the summer, mercifully, while everyone is fishing or recreating or just taking a walk in nature without the mask. We'll start back up with the next webinar sometime in late August or early September, and we'd love to hear from you. What topics would you like us to dive into? Please email any ideas to Jennifer Halstead. If you've been moved to engage or to learn more, to take action today, here are a couple of ways to, to get involved. Um, and we talked about some of them. Visit the, defended, the, visit the Defend Bristol Bay website. There's a wealth of information there about action items, sign on letters, things that you can do. Um, visit Eva's Wild website and purchase a ticket to watch Mark's The Wild. It's a fabulous movie, I can tell you that. Um, and a portion of those proceeds goes to supporting the fight against the pebble mine. And eat wild Pacific salmon that's been North American caught. Make sure you ask the question. And the last thing is sort of apart from the salmon, but something that's really important to the slow fish community. Um, some of you may have noticed that there was a huge fire out on the San Francisco pier um, on May 23rd, where fishermen have lost millions of dollars of gear um, that's really, you know, set them back, put them on the verge of, you know, bankruptcy and not being able to get back in. So that's something else to think about because we're, we are a community and that's, we're, we're mutually supportive. So it's something that we want to um, keep our eyes on. I'd like to thank every one of today's storytellers, including John Broderick, Melanie Brown, Sally Barnes, Skylar Folks, Cap Karskallen, Mark Titus, Marsh Skeel, and Representative Jared Huffman. I'd also like to thank John and Melanie for laying down some cool, spiritually awakening tunes. Immense gratitude to my colleague and dear friend, Elizabeth Herondeen, for all of her help as a rock star moderator and advisor in keeping our compass pointed to true salmon north. I'd like to also thank the incredible team that helped plan the webinar series and the, this webinar in particular. And again, this webinar was very special and it took a lot of work to pull together. These 10 members include Amy Grondon, Anna Moulet, Brett Tolley, Giselle Kennedy Lord, Kelly Collins Geyser, Kevin Scribner, Michelle Mesmet, Gary Granada, Denisa Livingston, and Jacqueline Ross. <clears throat> Finally, special thanks to One Fish Foundation intern Jennifer Halstead, who continues to sprinkle magic dust on everything so that it gets done beautifully, like coordinating all the tech stuff for this webinar, which is way over my head, and ensuring I stay focused, which these days is a monumental task. This webinar has been a co-production of Slow Fish, Slow Food USA, Slow Food Turtle Island, One Fish Foundation, Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance, and Forever Wild Seafood. I'm Carla Stoll, president of One Fish Foundation, asking you all to stay safe, keep your physical distance, but remember that sense of community we've been talking about. We heal together. We grow together stronger buy local seafood, you know, like, like smoked salmon, right? And by the way, Sally, please figure out a way to get some to me. Um, um, you know, and ask the questions that matter. And if you've got some, share it with someone who may not get around as much as you. And do as our sister Denise suggests, spread a pandemic of peace, prayer, and positivity. These days, we really need it. So Melanie, would you please send us out on a high note or a low note or any of your beautiful notes in between to seal the unity and healing we've generated today? I will try. Thank you so much, Collis, for including me in this. Um, I, uh, I'm planning on playing three songs, if that helps you sort of get a sense of how long you want to stick around. Um, 
Uh, I'm going to share a Bob Marley song. Um, and unfortunately, my partner that I did a Bob Marley song with on the last Slow Fish crew together, he, he's at work. So uh, Marcus won't be doing this song with me. But um, this song, I hope you don't perceive it as negative. To me, it really conveys the intersection between environmental and social injustice. Um, it's called Bad Card. And um, I would like to uh, you to think um, as you hear it as if I am singing it to our president in the United States. I'm going to back up a little bit so I don't blast you. Excuse me. song that's more loving uh, in its approach. And uh, it was written by a woman named Ruth Unger. Um, and she was inspired to write it by the water protectors at Standing Rock. Um, Ruth Unger sings with a band called The Mammals. And you should check out their music. They, um, they learned from a great Mr. Pete Seeger. And um, Okay, I just need to calm down a little bit before I enter into the song. It's called My Baby Drinks Water. My baby drinks water. My baby drinks tea. My baby eats salmon from the Bristol Bay streams. My baby drinks milk mother nature gave me so please spare the water for my little ones and me now money buys houses and clothing and more and money buys food at the big grocery store and money buys trinkets 
and money buys toys. But it won't buy the earth back for our little girls and boys. Do you measure your wealth by the size of your purse? What size is your coffin? What size is your hers? What size is your heart if you put money first? High over the children and their hunger and thirst. My baby drinks water, my baby drinks tea. My baby eats salmon from the Bristol Bay streams. My baby drinks milk Mother Nature gave me. So please spare the water for my little ones and me. Um, I'm gonna share, thank you. I'm gonna share one more song. Um, it's by Jay Farrar of Sun Volt. It's called Windfall. And this is a song that I love to share um, with fishermen as a blessing to, to their fishing because the wind plays such an important role in our success or failure as fishermen. Um, it, it's a song about being on the road, but um, it's really easy to translate to uh, being on the water. It's called Windfall. Oh, I'm sorry, I gotta set my capo. Now and then it keeps you running Never seems to die Trail spent with fear and not enough living On the outside <laughs> Never seem to get far enough Staying in between the lines Hold on to what you can Waiting for the end, not knowing when. May the wind take your troubles away. May the wind take your troubles away. Both feet on the floor, two hands on the wheel. May the wind take your troubles away. Trying to make it far enough to the next time zone Few and far between Past the midnight hour You never feel alone You're really not alone Switch it over to AM Searching for a truer sound Can't recall the call letters Steel guitar, settle down. Catching an all night station somewhere in Louisiana. It sounds like 1963, but for now, it sounds like heaven. May the wind take your troubles away. May the wind take your troubles away. Both feet on the floor, two hands on the wheel. May the wind take your troubles away. May the wind take your troubles away. May the wind, wind take your troubles away. Both feet on the floor, two hands on the wheel. May the wind take your troubles away. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, Melanie. That was wonderful, as always. Very heartfelt and just a great way to um, wrap this up. Um, again, I mean, here we are. <laughs> We're almost 20 minutes past and we still have a good crowd. Um, so I want to thank everybody. We will share the link 
to the video on the YouTube channel via an email to everyone who has subscribed or who registered um, and will broadcast it. And as events warrant, when there are other ways to chime in or to get involved, we'll make that all available as well. So again, thank you all for joining us. This is really an important conversation. Um, and just stay tuned because we're going to do it again. Thanks, everyone. I can't wait to see your faces in person here, hopefully not in the too, too distant future. Seriously. <laughs> Uh, thanks for inviting me. I really enjoyed my time here with you all. Good luck to you all. Fight the good fight. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you all. So grateful for the Salmon family. So take good care.